This is our Engineering 2130 Dynamics Final Project by Srimanth, Neil, Matthew, and Adam. We will be discussing the impact of weights and heights on a car strut. First, we'll discuss the overall purpose of a car strut. It's to provide structural support for the vehicle suspension and to hold the tire in an aligned position. The strut is also there to help dampen vibrations when a bump has gone over. The two images above show the impact of a vehicle going over a bump without a strut. As you can see, the tires are no longer in alignment and there's no longer a proper contact patch on the ground, reducing traction for the vehicle. The two images below show the impact of a strut in the system, where there's optimal contact even going over a bump as the top of the tire has shifted to allow for optimal traction to the ground. So for the calculations and the basic concept of what we're doing, this test consists of three phases. We have phase one right here. We have our height, which is this height here. And that we'll just call that H with no subscript. So we are calculating potential energy with our mass, uh, the, the, the magnitude of the mass times G times this H. This gives us potential energy in phase one. Moving on to phase two, we are assuming that in between phase one and phase two, there is perfect conservation of energy because there's no air resistance. That's an assumption that we're making. And given that, our kinetic energy at stage two will be equal to the potential energy at stage one. So when we reach stage two, if you look at this H1 and this H1, they are equal. So at the beginning, at, at the end of phase two, the mass has reached the strut, but has not compressed it. It just made contact before it pushed anything. Moving on to phase three, the strut compression height is going to change to H2. So the delta H is going to be H1 minus H2, and that's basically how much the strut has compressed. So what we're going to be looking at is how much energy the strut is absorbing and over how much distance does the force apply to this mass. So given that we have conservation of energy from stage two, we have our kinetic energy, all of that energy is going to be absorbed by the strut in this equation right here. And we're assuming this because the mass comes to a complete stop, which you will see in the testing. It, it goes from moving rather fast to a complete stop. So this is for our energy. Moving on to kinematics, we have velocity, uh, acceleration, and force. Um, it, we're using equations that do not include time because time is difficult to track. So we have our final velocity squared equals the initial velocity squared plus 2a delta x. Um, and we use this to arrive at this equation to find what our final velocity is. And that would be here at stage two. So this vf would be this v initial. Um, so we use that. And then we plug this value back into this equation to find our acceleration here. We use this acceleration after this, because we have our, our h1 minus h2. This gives us our delta x for this equation, which we'll just call this equation number one. Um, so we can get our acceleration from here. Now that we have acceleration, we can plug our acceleration into here and get our force. And our force will be applied to this mass for a given distance and show us where we end. So the force will be applied over a certain distance. Now we're moving on to our actual physical experiment. As you can see in the first image, we have our two weights with the weights listed off to the side. Now we move on to test one. Our drop height is 10 feet and we have our mass listed on the left hand side. For test two, we lower the overall mass being dropped, but we do not lower the drop height. For test three, we lower the drop height, but keep the mass consistent to test two. And for test four, we lower the drop height even further, but keep the mass consistent as test two and test three. Here's our experimental data from our four trials. Strut compression varies as we change the input energy by changing mass and height. I'll hand it over to Neil to further explain our calculations and interesting results. So going on to our calculations, we're going to start with energy. So we did three different tests and you will see that in the other parts of the video. So on the first test, we have a pound, we have a, a, a weight or a mass that we measured it on a scale. So this is pound mass and that would be this 18.8 right here. 
So we divide that by 32.2 to get our slugs. Um, we have our gravity, 32.2 feet per second. Our height is 10 feet. So if we plug this into our energy equation, MGH, this gives us 188 foot pounds. And based on what I explained in the other section, that will be the amount of energy that is also absorbed by the strut. So moving on to test two, it's basically the same process. We have our mass, our pound weight divided by our G, that gives us our mass. Uh, our, we have our G and our H. Uh, in the second test, we had 93 foot pounds of energy. It's substantially less than the first test, but that should be expected because it's about half the weight. Uh, test three, we started decreasing our drop height. So if you'll notice here, our H is only seven feet. In this test, we had 65.1 foot pounds of energy. Um, going down to test number four, again, we lowered the drop height. Uh, that would be here, four feet. So in this one, we had 37.2 foot pounds of energy. Now, if you'll notice in here, I also notated the delta X. This delta X is how much the strut compressed. So this would be 5.4 inches in this test. Um, in test number one, it was six inches, so on and so forth. Um, obviously, we're gonna have less strut compression with less energy involved. However, something interesting from that comes and you will see that in the kinematics part of this. So moving on to the kinematics. So we have our little free body diagram here. We have our mass, which is this little box and we have our force of the strut pushing up on it. We have the force of gravity and we have an acceleration. So it's gonna be accelerating in this direction, the positive Y direction, as you can see notated here. So basically the force of the strut is gonna be equal to the force of gravity on this mass plus the mass times acceleration of this box. So we have different tests. Um, first, we have these formulas uh, based on this formula right here, we can arrive at a couple of different helpful equations. The first one is going to be to calculate our initial velocity, which, you know, really it's kind of final because we're moving from, uh, from phase one to phase two to find our initial velocity for phase three. So th th it's kind of confusing, but basically the square root of 2gh, this will give us how fast is this mass moving when it reaches the strut. And that would be all of these here. So vi1, that's for test one, test two, test three, so on and so forth. The second equation that we have is to find our acceleration based on the delta x, basically how much the strut compressed. So we have our, our, our final velocity squared minus our initial velocity squared divided by two delta x will give us our acceleration. Now we know that our final velocity is gonna be zero because the mass will come to a complete stop by the force of the strut. So now that you see the equations, I will show you the results and what I thought was interesting. So moving on to test one, I'm gonna just show you the equations and what I thought was interesting. So for test one, we calculated this for acceleration. So our delta X was six inches, which is one half of a foot, which means our, our two delta X basically cancel out to just be one. So we end up with our velocity over one. Anyhow, the force that we calculated ended up being 35.3 pounds of force that the strut applied on that mass for a total of six inches. And we are assuming here that this is constant acceleration, which is likely not the case but that's what we're using. Uh, it, it, it should be very close, and you will see that in the videos. The acceleration does not appear to change. Um, test two is substantially less force on the object. So you can see the acceleration here is higher, 28.19, but because the mass is less, we have less force counteracting that mass because here we only have a 9.3 pound force um th th that's all the mass weighs so it's about half the weight so you know we have less force acting on it <coughs> moving on to test three um we have this acceleration uh basically the same thing our delta x in this case would have been five inches exactly so that's how we're calculating this value here is with the equation I explained previously. Uh, 
finally, for test four, this is what I find really interesting. So for here, our delta X is only 2.5 inches. Now, our drop height in this test was lower, so we had a very, we had a much lower initial velocity, and that would be this six, minus 16.05 up here. Because we started with that, and because the strut compressed less, we actually had more force on test number four than we did on three and two, even though we had less energy, and this is interesting. Um, and, and this happens because we're accelerating it a large amount over a much shorter amount of time, and because of this equation right here, because we're dividing by a smaller number, we're gonna get a larger number. Um, but this kind of goes to show how struts it, it appears that they basically just slow down movement by applying somewhat of a proportional force. So here are sources of error. Starting off, uh, even though we consider air resistance to be negligible during our calculations, air resistance is still a factor that could have caused some uh, misalignment in our calculations. Not to mention, when dropping the masses onto the strut, uh, we use the tube and friction from that tube could have caused energy loss due to friction and heat due to the mass rubbing on the sides of the pipe. Uh, it's also possible that the mass didn't land on the strut on its center of mass, meaning all the energy from, from the mass didn't get transferred over to the strut. And for trial one, uh, the strut maxed out, meaning it the strut traveled the maximum distance it could meaning any further displacement by the strut would not have been measured for our calculations. Uh, our, for our final source of error, we considered the piston part of the strut to be negligible, but uh, it's still a mass, uh, and not accounting for it could have messed up our numbers. So for this experiment, what did we learn? The first thing that you may have noticed, especially during the calculations, energy is not proportional to the amount of force that the strut applies on the mass. However, the energy is proportional to how much displacement we get from the strut, meaning how much the strut compresses. We can also see that struts absorb a lot of energy over a very short distance. For example, in our first, uh, in our first test, we had 188 foot-pounds of energy. If you compare that to a 22 long rifle bullet, for example, that bullet has about 80 foot pounds of energy at the muzzle of the gun. So we're basically putting more energy than a rather small bullet, but it's still something to note just by comparison. It, it's, a, it's a large amount of energy. Um, as far as suggestions go, um, one thing is, you know, we, the, the strut we were testing was from a street car. This car was never designed to be off-road. If you are going to go off-roading, you might want a longer strut that can have more travel because like you could see from test number one, when we put that much energy on it, it maxed it out. There was no more room for it to go. So if this was an off-road vehicle that might, you know, jump over a cliff or land on a stump or something, hit a very hard bump, you would want a longer strut so that that energy could be absorbed because you would need a longer distance to do that. Um, beyond that, I believe that is the end of the conclusion. Thank you for watching and have a wonderful Christmas.